Uh, tonight, I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read into your hearing verses 10, portions of a paragraph, verse 10 through 13, and then we'll skip down to verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, and then verse 19. I decided not to say anything about what happened at Pebble Beach because I don't want the Lord to take my power from me. <laughs> I'm reading from the New King James Bible, and here's how my Bible reads. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I won't be fancy with it. I'll just call it learning to be content. You may be seated. Learning to be content. Several years ago, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones came out with a hit song that said, I can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. The words of that song were written by one who had enjoyed wealth, success, and the pleasures of life. And after looking back through the rearview mirror over his life, he realized that when the smoke had cleared and the dust had settled, they discovered that he couldn't find any true happiness and satisfaction in this world. The words of that song are reminiscent of an age of people who are searching, searching for happiness, searching for a sense of peace and contentment, only to discover that this world does not offer the human heart the happiness and contentment for which they are looking. There's a certain restlessness in humankind that says that we are searching for significance, searching for a sense of satisfaction and contentment. But the problem is that many people cannot find what they are looking for because they're looking in all the wrong places and turning to all the wrong sources. Some search for happiness through materialism but don't find it. Others seek for joy through sexual prowess but only in what end up with fleeting pleasures and bitter disappointments. Others seek for a sense of fulfillment by obtaining positions of power on their jobs or by exercising excessive control in their homes but do not find it. And after turning to all of those sources trying to find a sense of happiness and contentment, they come to the same conclusion as did Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. They can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. I like a statement that Abraham Lincoln, who himself faced many miserable and difficult days, is said to have said. He said, most people are about as happy as they choose to be. I discovered that quote while reading a book co-authored by Drs. Frank Minareth and Paul Meyer. And the book is appropriately entitled, Happiness is a Choice. And in the book, these two well-known Christian psychiatrists suggest that if one is going to be cured of the causes and symptoms of melancholy and depression, one must choose to be happy. I couldn't agree with them more. Some people are depressed and others are melancholy because they have chosen to be. Now, I know that there are those of you who would disagree with my premise and say that our happiness or unhappiness is not simply a matter of one's conscious choice, but that it is a culmination of one's outward circumstances. Well, the Lord sent me here tonight to tell you, you can be happy regardless of your circumstances. 
And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across in this little letter that he writes to the Christians at Philippi. When you get a chance, you ought to read Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's only four chapters. And in this little missive, it's his thank you note that he writes to them to express his appreciation and thanksgiving for how over and over again they had supplied his physical and financial needs. Now, uh, I, I find it rather interesting that a common thread that runs throughout the, the entirety of this missive is the theme of joy or rejoicing or being happy in the Lord. And I find that pastor rather remarkable because when Paul wrote this letter he was facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life when Paul wrote this letter he was not in a five-star hotel no no when Paul wrote this letter he was not on a beach drinking a mimosa but no he's in a Roman jail his freedoms had been taken away from him he's incarcerated and yet over and over again Paul admonishes these believers to have joy how can he admonish them to have joy when he was facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life and I believe believe that Paul was able to encourage them to have joy because Paul understood that genuine Christian joy does not come from our circumstances but rather it comes from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me talk to somebody tonight that came into this room and you made up your mind that you are never going to be happy until all of your circumstances are ideal and until all the stars line up perfectly in your life. Well, baby, you're going to be unhappy a long time if you're waiting on that because genuine joy doesn't come from my happenings, but rather it comes when I know that I have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me share with you the little movements in this passage. I'll make some comments about it, and I'll soon take my seat. I believe that Paul is teaching us uh, in the first place that if, that if you're going to really have joy and true happiness, that you need to understand that, that, that your sufficiency is in the Savior. Yeah, your sufficiency is in the Savior. Listen to how he opens up in verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now Paul here is admonishing the believers at Philippi and commending them for how over and over again they had given generously to supply his physical and financial needs. And Paul is assuring them in verse 11, now I'm not writing this to you because I'm trying to get another offering from you. No, no, no. He says, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That word learned is an interesting word. Let's just say learned. It means to know by experience, to acquire the habit of. It's a word, if you will, um, um, that, that was used as a kind of secret initiation uh, word that, that one, if one learned a secret initiation, he would be permitted into these pagan uh, religious orders. And Paul Christianizes this idea and says, says, I have learned the secret to true contentment. My life and my many experiences, he said, have taught me to be content. Can the church say content? interesting word. It's a word that was used by the Stoic uh, the philosophers and it literally means self-sufficient or not needing the aid of one's outward environment in order to, deter to, to determine satisfaction and happiness. Paul Christianizes this Stoic idea and says, you're right. I don't need my circumstances to determine my sense of happiness and joy but unlike you stoics who are self-sufficient he said I am Christ sufficient that is because I have a relationship with Christ he has taught me the secret of being content satisfied happy um, it's kind of like the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat a, th a thermometer, it's controlled by the environment that it's in. 
so that if you walk into the room and the room is cold, the mercury falls. But if the room is hot, the mercury rises because a thermometer is controlled by the environment that it's in. But a thermostat, on the other hand, is not controlled by the environment, but rather it regulates the temperature of the room. And Paul is saying, listen, when you walk with Christ for a while, you don't practice a thermometer kind of joy. I'm happy if my circumstances are right. I'm happy if I live in the right house. I'm happy if I drive the right car. I'm happy if I make the right amount of money. No, no, no. But when you walk with Christ, you learn how to practice a thermostatic joy that I'm happy regardless of what may be going on at any one moment in my life. I may not live in the house that I want to live in right now, but I'm happy in my apartment. I may not drive the car that I want to drive right now, but I'm happy on the bus stop. I may not eat steaks every day, but I'm happy eating peanut butter and jelly because my happiness doesn't come from my happenings. It comes from my relationship with Christ. So let me talk to a single Christian. Stop moping and feeling sorry for yourself and having your pity party. Won't nobody date me and won't nobody take Baby, go get your hair done. Get your nails done. Get yourself a pedicure. Buy yourself a new dress and take your own self out because your happiness shouldn't come from whether you got this man or woman in your life. It should come from your relationship with the Lord. Now, when you understand that your sufficiency is in the Savior, it tells me, Pastor, that you have more than likely matriculated at one of two major universities in life. In, in this 12th verse, literally, there are two universities. There are two schools, I see, in, in this 12th verse. In this 12th verse. He, he says, he says, he said, and, and I'll call the first school, I'll call it the University of Prosperity. Yeah. The University of Prosperity. He says in verse 12, he says, I know how, how to, I know how to abound and I know how to increase. I know how, how to abound. That is, I know how to have plenty. I know how, how, to, how, how to trust God when God causes my life to increase. I know what it's like to have plenty of money in my pocket. I know what it's like to have plenty of food to eat and have all of my needs supplies. I know how to do that because I've been to the University of Prosperity. I was, I came from an influential family. I grew up in, a, in, a, in an influential background. I attended the finest universities of my day. I've been to the University of Prosperity, but I did not allow my prosperity to cause me to lose my sense for having an acknowledgement of God in my life. You know, brothers and sisters, someone has suggested that prosperity has done more to damage some Christians than adversity. Because when some of us make a nickel more than somebody else, it goes straight to our heads. Walk around with your nose in, in the air, your nose so far in the air until if it rained, you would drown. And it seems, Pastor, the more God blesses us, the less we feel we need God in our lives. The more affluent we are, the less we feel we need to go to church on Sunday. That Sunday is not a time to go worship the Lord and take the family to church. It's a time to go golfing with our friends. And nobody likes to golf more than your pastor and I. But I would submit to you today that if anybody ought to be in church every Sunday, it ought to especially be those of us whose skin has been darkened by Mother Nature's son. Because don't fool yourself, everything that we have acquired as a people in this nation, we got it through the direct or indirect influence of the black church. It was the black church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation. And now you are able to work on those jobs and live in those neighborhoods and drive those cars and make that money but now that some of you have moved on up to the east side and finally gotten your piece of the pie you act like you don't need to go to church anymore shame on you what is it about our affluence that causes us not to acknowledge God like we should when we were poor you went to church all the time What's, what is it about affluence and losing an acknowledgement of God. I guess the Lord has sent me to ask you this question. Listen, how high can I lift you without losing you? How much can I bless you with? 
and you still understand I still need God in my life. But wait, but wait, there's another school. It's in the same 12th verse. Because not only does he, and I'll call it, I'll call it the university of adversity. Because not only did he say I've learned how to abound and to increase, he said, but I've learned how to be hungry and to suffer need. Uh, look at how the pendulum swings. One moment he's on the mountaintop of blessings with every one of his needs met, but the other top moment he's hungry and he's suffering need in dire straits. Life, he says, hadn't been no crystal stairs for me. He said, no, I've, I've been to the university of adversity. Some people call it the school of hard knocks. I've been, I've been, I've been, I've, I've spent a day and a night in the deep. I've been, I, twice I've received 39 lashes. I, I've been stoned and left for dead. I, I've had Christian friends to turn their backs on me. Uh, he said, I've been to the university of adversity. There have been times when I was so broke, I didn't know how I was going to make it. Didn't have sufficient clothes to put on my back. But whether I had a pocket full of money or if I was so broke that I couldn't pay attention, I have learn life has taught me to be content um, good friend of mine Tullis Chapman we were preaching for Frank Ray oh 10 12 15 years ago and he told me this story we were sitting in the car together he said that he decided to take his wife on a bucket list honeymoon destination they had never gone to Hawaii and so he wanted to surprise her, take on this bucket list honeymoon. They went to Hawaii. And as they were walking down the beach, he said, Pastor, everywhere you looked, it was postcard beauty. The sun was shining brightly. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. The birds were catching the warm thermals as they were soaring high in the atmosphere. Little children were building sand castles in the sand couples were walking down the beach holding hands. The foliage was effervescent. It was beautiful. Everywhere you looked, it was postcard beauty. He said, but pastor, among that beauty on the beach that day, he said, I saw something that looked like it didn't belong there. He said, I saw a homeless man rummaging through the garbage trying to find something to eat in order to eke out a meager living for himself. He said, I was arrested by this apparent ugliness amid this postcard beauty. He said, Pastor, I, I noticed that the homeless man found in the garbage a cold, half-eaten, cold, dirty, germ-infested hamburger. He said, I watched the man as he got the burger out the trash, this cold, half-eaten, germ-infested hamburger. He said he began to unwrap the burger, and then he began to brush away as much dirt and debris that he could from this half-eaten, cold, dirty, germ-infested burger. He said, the man sat by the roadside, by the curb. He said, but uh, after unwrapping it, before he took a bite, he put his hands together. He bowed his head and he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. He said, baby, did you see that? That homeless man is thanking God for a half-eaten, cold, dirty, German-fested burger. I've got to do something for him. He go, went to McDonald's and got him a hot burger and some fries and a Coke. He said he handed the man the bag. The man didn't even look up at him. He reached in the bag, got the burger out, unwrapped the burger, but before he took a bite, he put his hands together. And he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. Wait, wait. He was just as thankful for a half-eaten, cold, dirty, German-fested hamburger as he was for one hot off the grill. That homeless man is a living manifestation of what Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And if a homeless man knows how to thank God, if a homeless man knows how to acknowledge God, surely you and I who's got clothes on our backs and a roof over our head and food on our table, we we ought to stop complaining so much. I, I have learned in what, whatever state I am, 
to be content. Because my contentedness does not come from my circumstances. It does not come from my degrees behind my name. It doesn't come from what I drive or where I live or what I wear or who I know downtown. But my sense of contentedness, sufficiency, is in the Savior. But wait, wait, Paul tells us a second thing, that if you're going to learn to be content, he tells us not only that you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior, but you need to know the source of your strength to be content. That is, verse 13, one of the most quoted and one of the most misapplied verses in all the Bible. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let church say strengthens me. It means to energize, energizing me. Listen, this is a participle, a participle. This ain't deep, this is seventh grade grammar. What's a participle? A participle is a verbal adjective modifying the verb. What's the verb? I can do all things. How you gonna do it? Participle, Christ strengthening me. In other words, in human strength alone, I can't be happy if I lose my job. In human strength alone, I can't be happy if I don't drive the right car. But if Christ strengthens me, if he pushes me in the back, I can. I can. I can do it. I said I can do it. We, we, we misapply this, this verse and make it a catch-all for everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right, you go stand on the railroad track and a train coming at 70 miles an hour straight at you and hold your hand up and say, I can do all things. You won't be with us long. When you interpret the scripture, you ought always interpret it in light of the context. What's the contextual uh, situation? Paul is saying, I have learned to be content regardless of how what I'm facing in my life how you gonna do it participle Christ strengthening Christ pushing me in the back when you understand that Christ is the one who gives you the strength to be content regardless of your circumstance it tells me first of all that um that you can be positive about your potential. You know, many people don't know that Christ is the one who strengthens us to be content. And so their lives have been reduced to a, heapless, a helpless heap of I can't. You got the I can't syndrome. I can't do it. You ever met, you ever met negative folk? I mean, people, every time you see them, they act like they got a bad case of the blues. How you doing? I ain't doing well. How you doing? I ain't going well. Listen, baby, a broke clock is right twice a day. Every now and then something positive ought to come out of your mouth. Ah, uh, when you understand that, 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 that you, 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 you don't have to look at the circumstances of your life as a glass half empty, but with Christ in your life, you can look at it as half full. The Lord never came to give us that kind of negativity. The Christian life was never meant to be full of negativity, but Christ came us to give us a ray of hope amid the darkness of our despair so that on the worst day of your life, and when it seems like you are at the end of your road, it's not the end of the road, but as Sandy Ray said, it's just to bend the end of the road. Because with Christ, you can be content regardless of your circumstance. But not only does it teach me you can partner with the power of Christ, but it teaches me, uh, or rather you can, be po you can be positive about your potential, but then you can partner with the power of Christ. You will hear people say, I can't, I can't. But you will never hear a person say, God and I can't. As a matter of fact, the only time you use can't with God is when you put fail on the end, God can't fail. And yet, and yet, let me slow down and say, all right, I, I, I hear some of you thinking, oh, nice, ni ni nice sermon, Pastor. That's a nice little sermon uh, that you're preaching, uh, Pastor. Nice try, but you just don't understand what I'm going through in my life. That if you knew what I was going through in, in my life, you would know why I can't be happy. Appreciate you, Pastor, talking about participles and all that. But if you knew what I'm dealing with, you'd understand. Maybe I'm talking to somebody today 
that is getting ready to face the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas, when a loved one has died. And over the last three years, it's been three years of death where COVID has taken so many of our loved ones and our coworkers and our friends and our relatives. And you say, Pastor, this is the first Christmas season, the first Thanksgiving season when mama's not here. And if you understood my pain, Pastor, you'd understand why I can't be happy. And that's somebody else said, well, Pastor, Pastor, uh, if you only understood my financial situation, man, I'm in, I'm in so much debt. I'm over my head. I, I look up at this mountain of debt. It looks like I'm trying to climb Mount Everest. If you only knew how jacked up my finances are, you'd understand why I can't be happy. Nice try, though, Pastor. Nice try. Pastor, if you understood the kind of marriage that I live in, you don't understand why I can't be happy. Now, all out in public, both of you, y'all act like you got it together, but both of you deserve an Academy Award <laughs> because the reality is it's all jacked up at the house. You feel like you have to walk on eggshells in your own house. If you can't say amen, just look amen. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> you say, Pastor, for the marriage like this, you'd understand, man, why I can't be happy. Pastor, if you understood... You know, the kind of ch children I'm, ha I'm having to deal with, uh, th th this son of mine, this daughter of mine, I'm having to leave, leave my job almost weekly because they keep cutting up at school and I don't know what to do with them. I feel like pulling my hair out. And if you understood what I'm going through, you'd understand, Pastor, why I, why I can't be happy. Well, I want to tell you today, maybe, maybe some people today, the problem is that you're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Some people turn to the alcohol bottle and say, if I can just get drunk enough and I can pickle my brains and anesthetize my feelings and I'll be happy if but for a moment only to discover that when Jack Daniel wears off, your problem is still there. Yeah. Others turn to the crack pipe and say, if I can just get high enough, I'll rise above my problem if but for a moment only to discover that whatever goes up has to come back down. And when you come back down from your drunken stupor, life and problems are still staring at you. Others turn to the shopping mall and say, if I can just buy myself the right St. John knit or if I can get me some shoes with red bottoms, I'll be happy only to discover that 30 days later you have shot yourself into a mountain of debt. Others turn to the eating table and eat themselves into bad health. But can I recommend something better than the alcohol bottle, better than the crack pipe, better than the shopping mall? Why don't you turn to Christ? Because you ain't going to be happy until Christ is in your life. Okay, how big your house is, how nice your car is, how, how nice your clothes are. True happiness only comes through Jesus Christ. Do I have a witness in here? Uh, lest I keep you too long. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for inviting me to come to share this little lesson with you all tonight. But Paul teaches us one last lesson, and I think it's this. That if you want to be happy, you need to know that what you sow will affect your supply. Oh, there it is. Verse 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Now, you know, Pastor, a lot of people are unhappy. You know why? Because their needs are not being met. But could it be that the reason some people's needs are not being met, watch this, same text, same context, is because they're not giving like they ought to give. Now, you were shouting on verse 12 and verse 14. I'm in the same text, same context. Paul here is making a promise to the Philippian believers. But it is not a promise that everybody can claim. Are you with me today? It is a promise that has a prerequisite attached to it. Are y'all with me today? Now, a whole lot of folk wanna claim the promise of verse 19 without participating in the process of verses 14 to 18. And in verses 14 to 18, Paul acknowledges that over and over and over again, the Philippian believers kept giving to supply his needs. Are y'all with me? Now, you Bible readers ought to know that the Philippian church was perhaps the poorest church in the New Testament. Paul wrote of them in Corinth and said, not only did they give out of their poverty, but they gave out of their deep 
poverty. And yet while they were the poorest church in the New Testament, they were the most generous church in the New Testament. And Paul is saying that because you gave to supply my needs out of your poverty and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Uh, the Bible says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. The Bible says, he that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, but he that gives bountifully shall also reap bountifully. The Bible says, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse and prove me now here with death, the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive, and I will rebuke the devour for your sake. That word rebuke means to hold back. I'll hold back the bugs. I'll hold back the canker worms. I'll hold back the caterpillars that come to eat up your harvest. I don't know about you, but I gotta be generous with God because I need God to hold back some stuff. I need God to rebuke some stuff. You don't know the times you've been on a parking lot and a fool had made up his mind. He was gonna hit you in your head and take your money. But why didn't it happen? God rebuked it. God rebuked it. Do I have a witness in here? Oh, child of God, if you understood this law that Paul is teaching, if you want to claim the promise of verse 19, participate in the process of verse 18, 18 through 14 to 18. Listen, child of God, um, I see a whole lot of people come to church every Sunday. And if I use this farmer metaphor, you looking down your row, you know, the farm done plowed up the field, and you looking down your row, and you waiting on your breakthrough, and you waiting on your blessing. Now, I don't know how to drive a tractor. I, I, I wouldn't know what I'm doing out there. But I do know this. If you haven't planted anything, ain't nothing coming up. So what you want, you want a seedless harvest. I'm waiting on my breakthrough. I'm waiting on my Boaz. <laughs> but I ain't planting nothing. I'm not giving anything. If you want to claim the promise of verse 19, I encourage you, brother, sister, no gimmicks, no games, nothing up my sleeve. I encourage you to participate in the process of verses 14 through 18. Watch what he says, and my God shall supply all my needs. Now, some of us think if we give God money, that means God got to give us money in return. No, 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 no. How about a good night's sleep? How about peace in your home? How about some joy in your life? Do I have a window? All my needs. But watch this. He doesn't say according to what I need. Now that would be good enough for me. But he biggest sizes his own blessing according to his riches in glory. In other words, you will never have a need that will exhaust God's supply. Why? Because we serve a rich God. How rich is God? Immeasurably rich, incalculably rich. Do I have a witness here? He's rich in life. He's the living God. He's rich in strength. Is anything too hot for God? He's rich in power. He's the all-powerful God. He's rich in knowledge. He's the omniscient God. He's rich in goodness. The whole earth is full of his goodness. Do I have a witness here? He's rich in love. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We serve child of God, a rich God, which tells me you will never have a need that will exhaust God's supply. So I leave you here tonight when I tell you that you got to understand that your happiness does not come from what you drive. Your happiness does 
not come from what you wear. Your happiness does not come from where you live. But when you have a relationship with Christ, you understand that true happiness comes through Jesus. And so I made up my mind that I may not drive the car I want to drive, but I choose to be happy. I may not live in the house I want to live in, but I choose to be happy. Can I get a witness? I may not have the marriage I want to have, but I choose to be happy. I choose to lift up holy hands. I choose to open my mouth. I choose to give God the fruit of my lips. Can I get a witness? Is there anybody, anybody in the building that's made up your mind? You're going to praise him regardless of how your life looks. Anybody in the building that's not ashamed to tell God thank you. If you're not ashamed, stand up on your feet. Hold your head back. Close your eyes and shout glory. Glory. Hey. Hallelujah. Do you feel like I feel? Do you feel what I feel? How do you feel? 